Welcome and thanks for accessing this video, our next installment of Inspired for Mission. Our topic this time was finding God in authentic diversity work. I had the great opportunity to interview a few members of the circle group of Wales, uh, All Saints Wales Lutheran Church. This is a group of predominantly white people who um, took it upon themselves, were moved to take it upon themselves to learn more and to raise their own awareness about racial injustice. They began by watching videos and reading books together and found that the more they delved into um, these spaces where sometimes they became uncomfortable or had challenges to um, doing the work, that they grew from this work and were able to learn more and to be an impact in their community and in their congregation. And so I invite you as you or your congregation may be watching this video um, to just lean in and to be inspired as well about ways that you can take action or raise awareness or make a difference in your community, in your church, in your family. I could see this video being used for any of those things. And so we invite you to join us as we begin this conversation. Um, we are excited to have Pastor Rafi here and she is going to share with us um, some wonderful work that is being done by a congregation that she had an opportunity to hear from, um, All Saints in Wales. Um, and there should be three people joining her that will tell us about the DEI work that they're doing. Um, as you may know, Pastor Rafi is the assistant to the Bishop for Authentic Diversity and for Leadership. And I am a member of the Mission Table um, that sponsors Inspired for Mission. So welcome everyone that has joined us. We're delighted that you are here. Um, and I'm just going to say a quick prayer as we get started. Lord, we thank you for this time. We thank you for Pastor Rafi and the members of All Saints that are joining us today. We thank you for the mission table, the work that it, that the people on the mission table do, and for Reverend Matt, who leads us along with Pastor Jamie um, Larson McClune. Thank you for this time. Bless it. May we learn from this and grow. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Pastor Rafi, take it away. Amen. Thank you so much, Dr. Rose. And thanks, everybody, for being here tonight. I am really, really excited um, to have been asked to participate in this conversation and to lead the interview with uh, the circle group, uh, several members of the circle group from All Saints Wales tonight. And so we'll be hearing from three of those members, George, Jean, and Catherine, and they're all on with us tonight. Um, and I first met um, the circle group a few months back and had the opportunity to go to their church and to learn what the circle group is doing um, and how it's affecting their community, how it's affecting them and their spiritual journey. And um, it, it really was an inspirational visit um, for me because of how um, passionate and committed the circle group is to raising their awareness around all sorts of isms, all sorts of oppression, um, and specifically anti-racist work. Um, and so I want to lift them up tonight and just celebrate them um, and hope that um, others will be inspired as I have been. And so I just want to start off um, with the question um, if you all could just share with us, what what is the circle group? What is the makeup of the group? And um, how did you come together? So one of us has got to go first, I guess. Okay. I, 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 <laughs> I, I'm an old professor, so I anyway, can't be shut up. So uh, we, we formed um, in 2020, shortly after the George Floyd murder to try to understand some of the things that were going on. Um, we called ourselves a circle group because we met sitting in a circle outside in the patio of, separated by 
six to 10 or 12 feet uh, with a cross in the middle of our of our circle. And we did a lot of, of searching and trying to make sense of what we saw then. Um, the first few meetings, I we may have had 20 to 25 people come and um, the last three years, our attendance has been about eight to 10 or 12 and and some faithful people who have really done a lot of soul searching. I would say the makeup also of our group is um, we have um, a woman in her 20s and we have a woman in her 80s and um, everything in between. Uh, we have had people come and go depending upon uh, their life experiences and also their situations so even though people have left the group um, we often hear back from them if they've moved away uh, they will send us their concerns they will send us information um, and so it's, it's a fluid group um, and we welcome not only members of our congregation but friends we have had friends that have visited for a while and um, we have people of different denominations um, so just a cross section and, and everybody brings something to the table, something a little bit different, which helps us to um, explore what we think we know and um, find out a lot of what we don't know. And I started um, <clears throat> a few, a, the group had already been meeting and um, I started a few weeks in and I, I happened to pick up our um, church newsletter. <clears throat> Apparently I don't read it that well every single week. And I saw this blurb in there about the circle conversation, uh, the circle conversation meeting. And um, the first things that we started to do, it, it was in the, uh, in the newsletter that they were going to be talking about watching videos, the video of um, uncomfortable conversations with a black man. And I just knew immediately I wanted to go and, um, and said to my husband, wow, they're offering this. I haven't seen this before. I'm, I'm going to go. And he also said, oh, me too. I'm going to go as well. Um, so, and it seemed to be, I was really looking, wanting a place to talk about, ask questions, and to talk about um, what was happening in the news. Uh, and the uh, the awfulness of it, um, it was shocking to me. And it, it wasn't just George Floyd. For me, it was many instances before. And, um, and then the death of George Floyd was so shocking and horrifying. And that sort of spurred us into action, um, at least to get together and to have a place to talk about um, what we were, what what is happening? What is happening? And so from there, we've just been, um, we've really never stopped. There's been, it's been conversation, it's been videos and TED Talks and books and people coming in to speak and people sharing um, whatever they come upon, if it's magazine articles or TV shows or movies or um, articles, magazine articles, newspaper articles, um, <clears throat> everybody brings something to the table and there's a constant um, sharing of resources, so. I'm so glad you touched on that. Um, and what I'd like to ask next is, um, we know you've covered a range of different topics or a range of, um, read a, a bunch of different books and um, had a lot of conversation. And one of the questions I have for you all is, um, what are some of the issues that you have discussed that you feel have been most impactful? Certainly, the starting with the uncomfortable conversations with a black man got us all excited and 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 bothered 
Um, and, and that line of thought has carried on and we've visited it in lots of, of different ways. We've read books about um, white privilege, uh, about being an ally, inclusive mindsets. Um, we've also spent some time looking at the um, lead issues in Milwaukee and our prison system. Um, we do some work with the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. And so we've spent some time talking about that. Um, one man who came to our group for quite a while before he moved to Madison um, had adopted uh, daughters from Asia. And we spent a lot of time talking about some of the challenges that they were finding in our local school systems. Uh, we've talked about gender issues, um, Tulsa, several Martin Luther King issues. Um, we've we've touched on lots of different things. We also um, realized that our vocabulary and our knowledge of some of the terminology that's present um, in our newspapers and on TV, we, we were lacking. We, we didn't understand what all the terms meant. And so um, putting together a list of uh, who the different groups were and what they stood for and um, what were just some of the terms that, uh, that, were, that we were hearing on the news and what that meant uh, to us and um, helping us to understand the issues a little bit more too. Um, and I think we also talked and did a little role playing on how do we have these uncomfortable conversations with our friends, maybe with our families, uh, maybe people that we have different opinions. How, how do we respectfully um, um, talk to them about issues that we were not going to necessarily back down from, but we wanted them to understand where we were coming from. Um, but do it in a respectful way. And that, that has been really hard. I mean, that we spent quite a bit of time just asking each other, how would you handle this? How would you handle this situation? This is someone very important to me, but I need them to understand. And um, again, just having those conversations um, week after week after week, we found we were a place of safety for each other. And we could say things that um, oh, oh, maybe, oh, we, maybe we weren't stuff. right, yeah. um, you know. We, but um, so that I really appreciate. I really have appreciated that. I was. I think what would impact. What has impacted me so much is learning how much I did not know, and um, I have thought that I was pretty sophisticated. Um, and I, I have thought, and I, I do know a lot, but the, the, the deeper learning that happened for me, um, and the, the awareness of, um, you know, the, the bubble that I had lived in, that I have lived in for all of my life, the, the white bubble that I've lived in for all of my life. And, um, and never knowing that it was a bubble, uh, not thinking outside of that. Uh, and then, you know, all of the, all of the listening that we did, all of the reading that we did, all of the talking that we did. Um, and, and I remember there was one afternoon I was at home and I was reading, um, a book called White Supremacy and Me. And uh, as I was reading it, I was aware of, this is making me so uncomfortable. Um, I was physically uncomfortable. And as I was reading it, and the author was saying, right about now, you are probably getting very uncomfortable and you're gonna wanna put the book down. And she said, don't. And it was like, oh my gosh, I wanted to put the book down so badly. <laughs> and walk back into my life. Um, so I, I, I don't think I'll ever forget that. That was pretty striking to me. And so what was most impactful for me was uh, learning how much I didn't know and having my eyes really opened. 
Um, I have a daughter that has always said, um, she's very, I don't know how to describe her, but she's always said, everything is about racism. And I used to say, oh, come on, stop, enough, no. And then it was like, oh, geez, it is. Oh, it really is. And um, so also the conversations that we've had that Jean mentioned of how do we talk to people, you know, without getting angry, uh, getting impatient, uh, being respectful, um, but also standing our ground and sticking with our positions. Um, and we keep coming back to that time and time and time again. It's not just one conversation. It comes up regularly. How do we talk to people? That question and that you all have been wrestling with that. And it, it's racism is a really uncomfortable subject for many folks to talk about. Um, and, and I, I also appreciated the mention of learning the language, um, that is currently being used to, to discuss racism and to discuss oppression. And, um, and so I really appreciated that, that focus on learning the language, but I wanted to lean into a little bit more, um, what were some of the wisdoms that you all found in one another? around how to have that hard conversation with a family member who, who may react with anger or who may react with shutting down or, you know, which could cause some sort of serious rift. Um, what, what were some of the wisdoms that you found in one another? Well, I'm thinking of, um, we, we have talked a lot and I think support, tried to support each other around um, not reacting right away. Um, I think all of us have shared that an initial reaction when we're talking to, to some people is to get just angry right off the bat. And, um, and then there really isn't any conversation that can be had. Nobody wants to be preached at or lectured to. And so we focused a lot on, um, you know, what kinds of um, sort of not, I don't want to, sort of non-committal kinds of things to encourage people to talk more, to, to question, like, what do you mean by that? Mm -hmm. Tell me more. Um, what has your experience been? Um, and to drop a, a few things like, oh, that's that's not been my experience. Um, so those are the things that have stood out to me, just the 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 ways that we can not react right away uh, and encourage other people to talk more. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and and while we're talking about, dealing with or having conversations with people who um, may be very uncomfortable or who may have completely different viewpoints um, around the importance of not only talking about racism, but taking some kind of action. Um, I'm wondering, have you encountered, um, has resistance been a big issue? I know that it's something that you all have been talking about have you encountered a great deal of resistance in your community um, when it comes to doing the work that you're doing? I think we probably have three different answers to that and each other person in our group does too. Um, in, in terms of outright hostility, probably not very much, uh, but we live in Western Waukesha County and there are people who hold opinions different from ours on almost any topic you could mention. Um, one of the indications that it's it's not exactly resistance, 
but of the you know dozen or 15 people who show up from time to time there's only one couple who comes regularly um, and that's Catherine and Jim none of the rest of us can get our spouses to come um, not necessarily because there's intense conflict at home but there certainly is not um, unanimous opinion and there, there probably isn't at Catherine and Jim's house either but um, we we when we started, there were quite a few people who came the first few weeks who left feeling accused of being racist. And um, at a certain level, we all need to be, um, but it takes a lot of movement to get to the point where one is willing to say that. And some of the people that that were coming and were interested in these issues uh, will not come anymore because of of the hurts that they felt. Um, we'd like to think that that we're a bit more empathetic now than we were at the beginning, but when you're just figuring things out for yourself, and uh, that that cause some hurt feelings. And it is curious because, um, you know, our group has not grown like, like George said, you know, we, we've actually decreased it in overall numbers, regular uh, people coming. Um, and yet our church um, you know, has many different partnerships that we um, support, Hepatha, uh, Tanzania, Sangoro, Cambodia, we do. And um, so it is this kind of a, a line, so to speak, that people walk um, almost like a balance beam. And um, to me, my, this is my just my opinion. Um, sometimes sitting down and talking face to face with someone about things that are uncomfortable it's harder to do than maybe giving support financially or you know buying different things for organizations and um, because we do have wonderful people in our congregation that are very giving and are very generous um, but for some reason we have found some resistance um, with coming and meeting Yeah, I. Um, people, oh, go ahead, Catherine. Well, I've had people not in our church, but um, when I've mentioned uh, going to the circle conversation, and the response is, "Are you still going to that? Why are you still going to that?" Um, which, which I think is interesting because it's they they sort of there's this expectation I think that you know we have conversation for a period of time, and then it's you're done. And we've started to discover we're not done. Yeah, yeah. And that's that I feel like that's one of the most daunting pieces of this is that this is a lifelong journey. It is a lifelong work. Um, and and I think that's sometimes the thing that deters us or that can hinder a person from from wanting to dig in. And so I, I found it really exciting when I came to visit with you all that not only are you guys, um, you know, you're not towing the line, you guys crossed the line and you took it further than just having some conversations. Um, you began to do things in your community and take action in ways that I thought were pretty um, powerful. And so I wanted to just ask if you could share with the group um, what your um, experience was in helping to raise awareness around what happened in Tulsa. Um, and when we were talking, we were saying, you know, we didn't learn about this in school. This was not in the history books, um, but it's something that's so huge and so impactful to the nation and to the African-American community. Um, and so I, it really was impressive that you all took some steps around that. So would you share with the group what 
what the Tulsa movement <laughs> or what the Tulsa um, um, action and work was all about. Well, George, you're up. Uh, oh, sorry. Jane, I was just, I'm just going to make one little thing and then George can be up. Um, you know, we have realized that um, a lot of the history that we've learned um, is through the lens of the white European Americans. And so there are many stories that we have heard one side of, and it is history, but there's also another lens that also uh, interacts with the same situation or the same, um, you know, event. And Tulsa is a perfect, perfect example of that. Okay, take it away, George. And Jean speaks as a, as a history teacher in an elementary school, so she has some authority about what happens in the classroom. So, um, I, as I recall, one member of our group said, oh, I came across this thing about, about Tulsa. Anybody know anything about that? And I think there was an article maybe in the National Geographic or someplace else, and, and a couple others. This was just leading up to the 100th anniversary. And so we did a, a couple of weeks studying material that we could get our hands on. And one of our members said, let's do something. Let's, let's put out some yard signs. So we had some yard signs made, I don't know, maybe 40 or 50 of them, uh, and put them around the neighborhood. But we put eight or 10 of them along the, the road right in front of our church. And, and the signs just said, remember Tulsa, or, or something. I think that's what it said. Um, and there were two different neighbors who drove by on that road who stopped in to talk to the pastor to say, what's this, what's this all about? And we're, we're upset and offended, who stayed and talked for an hour, an hour and a half, and our, our pastor would not say that he convinced them of anything, but at least they listened. And there was, was a dialogue. And when they left, they knew some things that they didn't know before. Um, the only thing I wish that we had done differently the next time we do it is to alternate the Tulsa signs with American flags. Um, I, I don't really want to give the American flag to extremists on on one end i i want to claim that too but but the signs really generated some interest uh generated some discussion within some of our members uh, and led quite a few people to realize there's a lot of history that we've never heard jump in and say i love that <laughs> We don't want to give the flag to um, terrorists or supremacists, and I, I just appreciated that statement. But I'll, I'll turn it back over. I, I know Catherine and Jean, you may still have some comments there. Uh, well, we put a yard sign in our yard, and none of our neighbors said one single word. So, so there's that, you know. They didn't tear it down. They didn't spray paint it. They didn't deface it. They, but they also didn't ask. So, the people who stopped into the church and and asked, I, I give credit to. They uh, they they took the time to stop in and and question, and to have a conversation. One of the other things that I think that contributed to with our the 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 Roy Nelson who was our pastor at the time was a year from retiring or so and I think that that incident really gave him his voice that for for the remainder of his term with us uh, his sermons were much more focused on justice issues than they had ever been before um, I think that conversation contributed and and knowing that he was going to retire probably contributed some to courage as well. Um, but um, he he spoke out pretty bravely, I think, from the pulpit and took some grief for it. And I think that that was the incident that may have triggered 
in his mind, oh, I can do this. Wow. Yeah, that was that definitely is a powerful piece there. And and I think one of you mentioned that even the sign makers were kind of like, what does this mean? And yes. So you had an opportunity mm -hmm. to educate some folks that otherwise might have never thought about Tulsa. Or even knew about Tulsa. Right. I mean, just didn't even know about it. Yeah. Um. So in terms of your conversations, which you've um, said have been uncomfortable and, and have been a learning experience for you in that way, I wondered if you could speak to how important it may or has may have been or may be to be willing to be uncomfortable. How, how important is being uncomfortable to the process of of learning and becoming aware of the impact of racism? Well, I think initially um, when something is said or if something is brought up that I had never thought about before and if it makes me feel uncomfortable, you know, I stop and ask myself why. And a lot of times it's because I need more information. I might have made a judgment or or not even have an opinion. Um, and I think that uncomfortableness pushes you forward. I mean, it, it's hard, but um, it, it makes you just want to find out more. And, um, you know, that's that's the joy in all of this is um, the aha moments of oh my gosh, this is what I always thought, but this isn't how it really is. And maybe I need to start thinking about things in, in a different way. And it, and it helps when you have other people around you that are, you know, affirming the fact that, well, yeah, I guess I didn't know that either. Or, you know, maybe you should, we can think about it in this way or that way. And, and again, steer us in a direction maybe that we would not um, take on our own or hadn't thought about on our own. So I really appreciate that from the people that, um, that I'm in conversation with, because um, you know there is there is um, a strength in numbers and and affirming that we are on on a path that hopefully is right, but we're on a path together. Mm -hmm. I think being uncomfortable is everything. Um, Uh, it's so easy to and appealing to uh, want to go back into my own world where it is comfortable. Um, and I don't have to think about these things. And I don't have to be aware that other people don't have the same comforts as I do. Um, so I think it's necessary to be uncomfortable in order to change. I also um, I um, agree and support what Jean is, has said about the group is so important um, because we're able we're all we've all been able to share how uncomfortable we get um, and there is something about being able to share it being able to talk about it, being able to share it, um, and know that um, we're not the only ones. And um, and it's a safe place to talk about being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I think one of the main lessons that I've sort of drawn, I out of the group as our discussions have proceeded is in, in, in thinking about so many of the current events that we see is the understanding that I do not have the right to decide what offends you. If, if you're offended, that's real. And maybe I can do something about it and maybe I cannot, but it is not appropriate to, to dismiss the offense that somebody else feels. 
Um, for me, that's a step toward empathy of trying to figure out how on earth could you possibly feel that way? Um, I mean that question genuinely, not kind of the snide way that it sounds, but uh, trying to walk in somebody else's footsteps is really important to understand where we are and what we might be able to do about some of them. Uh, I think it's also been terribly freeing to say, you know, it's it's that that somebody else is not my problem. I'm my problem, because I might have some influence over what I do, where I may not have so much influence over what somebody else does or thinks. So part of the work is staying home and doing my homework. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think we we all have our homework to do. Um, I want to ask now, we're heading a bit towards 730, um, and we want to leave a little bit of time for questions. Um, and so I have one last question for you, and that is, what advice would you give to those on the call tonight or on the, in the meeting tonight um, who are in spaces where they'd like to see something like the circle group created or where they'd like to get started or to deepen their journey um, of learning and of awareness? Well, we have um, created, George has created uh, quite a running list of things that we have talked about and resources that we have used and certainly we would be willing to share that with anyone sometimes it's easier to modify than it is to create and you know also just looking through um, our topics uh, we have topics that are you know within our church within our community within milwaukee um, and we spent Oh, probably three weeks talking about uh, Palestine and Israel, the conflict when that first happened in October. Um, so we try to, we're trying to, to understand the world too. Um, and, you know, certainly people would be willing to talk to anybody that um, is interested in starting a group or having you come and join us if that's something you'd like to do just to see kind of how we do it. Um, again, sometimes it's easier to modify than it is to create. And that would be something we could offer. I, nice. I, I violently- Is that right? Pardon me? I said, and you all meet Monday nights at seven o'clock, right? Correct. Okay. So I, I violently agree with everything that Jean said but I would take another tack in, in advice to people listening. And that's, we never have known what we were doing. <laughs> we never right. have known what we were going to do. We, we the, 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 there never has been a plan. Um, Laura Drolly, who's also in this call has been a, a major part in, in leading us. Uh, but, um, we don't know what we're doing. And if you don't know what you're doing, that's that's fine. Um and just 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 start. The the toughest step is the first one. And um there are lots of resources available to help, but if if you think you need to know how this is gonna go, um Pastor Afi and Pastor Matt had to do quite a bit of arm twisting to get us to agree to to do this interview because i mean it, there's there's a sense in which we didn't feel like we had any wisdom to share what we have to share is the struggle um and so if you feel it's a struggle you're right jump on in I, i'm so glad that you said what you said george about 
we've never known what we were doing. We we did have the uh, advantage, so to speak. There's probably three different people in our group who are teachers and who are really good at sort of planning assignments, homework. Um, now, yes, there have been times we've all given, um, shared our ideas, talked about what we wanted to do next, what we wanted to read, what, you know, but you know, Laura and um, Kathy and um, Jean, I'm on the spot, so I'm forgetting people's names, really have, have done a lot of work in um, helping to kind of spearhead. Um, so we, I, I have to say that, you know. I will also say, I wanna be sure to, to include we, we've struggled a lot for sure, but we also all have come in at various times to talk about small victories that we've had, mm -hmm. uh, a conversation that we had, uh, um, a time when one of us was able to um, say what we had to say and uh, to people who are dear to us. Um, you know, when we and, you know, after after listening, after hearing Joe Elwanger on Sunday night, I sort of came home and thought, oh, my gosh, we haven't done hardly anything. Because anything. <laughs> um, he was fascinating. But in our own circles, we have, I think, attempted to and successfully uh, been able to speak up. Um, um, and it's so we have small victories and um, we have a place to share them. We come to the group and, you know, everybody has had an experience or more where they are able to say, all right, I, I, I had this conversation. I didn't back down. Um, it was difficult and and it was OK. So um, that's pretty fun when that happens. are very important. Um, so it's nice that you all have a, a practice of sharing those as well. And I wanna take some time um, and let the group know we we do honor the 7.30 time commitment. Um, if anyone needs to head out right at 7.30, um, please feel free to do that. We're gonna take a few, um, maybe just a couple of questions at this time and um, We'll try to end as close to 7.30 as possible. Um, so are there any questions that you all as a group um, have for the circle group tonight? Just wondering, um, that list of, of topics that you've created, George, or that you've kept, um, kept that running list going, can that be shared with the video on the uh, Synod's website when this video gets posted? Um. I may want to edit some pieces of it slightly, but the list of topics we've considered, absolutely. That'd be I'll, great. I'll Thanks. I'll send that to Pastor Alfie within a couple of days. Great. Okay, uh, Randy, go ahead. Yeah, if I may unmute here. Um, first of all, it's a phenomenal group. I'm, I'm so impressed with all of you. Thank you very much. Um, do you ever wander into Milwaukee and have your group meet with anybody in Milwaukee or have Milwaukee people come out to you? Um, well, I I work in Milwaukee every once in a while. Um, and we do several partnership activities with Hepatha. But at the same time, one of the shocks for us early on was a conversation with a group of people at Hepatha encouraging them that that some of us had, had met, um, encouraging them to, to come out. And they explained um, 
we don't think it's safe to come for us to come in your neighborhood. And what a shock that was. Aha uh, moment. Oh yeah. Um, we did one visit uh, to uh, the Victory Garden in Milwaukee and that that was very meaningful for the people who went, but there was only a, a few of us who went, not including me, unfortunately. Um, so there certainly are opportunities to do that and that we've not fully exploited. Are you wondering, like, if we meet with other congregations or if we just come into Milwaukee or I'm not quite well, sure. Yeah, me, me with other congregations. I, um, you know, this understanding, I went to, and this is a couple of years ago, our saviors had um, a um, church service and lunch uh, every Wednesday. And I was like the only white person in, in the room. And it took like six months before they would warm up to me. So this comment from George that, they're scared to come out by us. We're just as scared kind of sometimes to oh, go yeah. in with them. So um, it's just, I, I was I was wondering if you, were, you know, with Hepatha, I'm quite sure you have a lot of contacts with them though. So that's great. Okay, Randy, any other questions? Well, I, I will also to comment on his question. Another um, topic that has come up in our group regularly is how to expand our horizons, how to expand our exposure, I guess would be a good word, um, outside of the confines of our community. Um, So that, that is something that we continue to, to um, try to figure out. Um, I saw in the comments, somebody mentioned, um, somebody mentioned that book studies, oh, book clubs with others is very helpful. That was you, Randy. Um, and I think um, mixed groups, are really great for book studies. So it kind of plays into that same vein um, and and would encourage us to maybe follow that trail a little bit and see where it may lead us. Um, so that's one of the things that hopefully in this new year we can figure out um, who might be interested in a book study with um, people of all different ethnic backgrounds. Um, oh, sure, Laura. Oh, you said you're interested. <laughs> okay, great. Um, and I do want to let the circle group know that Pastor Alyssa did comment. And she said, I really appreciate hearing about the structure of your gatherings. Thank you for sharing. Our church has had a number of different conversations, learning opportunities, small groups, book discussions, but we've never done anything quite like what you are describing. I think we have a lot to learn from the model that you have used and been practicing. And um, Jerry Roche says that you all are always welcome to meet with Incarnation Lutheran um, and their services at 930 every Sunday. So I love the, the community that's already beginning to form here and just want to encourage everyone to be in contact and be in touch with each other support one another, call me, ask me questions if you need to get connected or if you've got an interest in, in doing something like what what the circle group is doing or, or contact them directly. Um, I want to thank all of you for your time and I'm going to, if we have no more questions, um, then I'm going to turn it back over to you, Dr. Rose. Thank you, Pastor Afi. And thank you so much, circle group, Catherine, Jean, and George, um, it was very enlightening um, and educational for me to hear that perspective. And I'm a person who, I'm a member of Cross in Milwaukee and Pastor Joe Elwinger was my pastor 
um, from the time that I was a teenager through early adulthood and someone that I'm still in awe of and um, know very well. Um, so I think that what you're doing is so important, exciting. Um, and one of the things that you highlighted for me was the fact that when you approach people who you're trying to share some of this knowledge with, that they feel like they're accused. And so I think that's the a challenge I see is that we want people to learn and grow and not feel like we're accusing them, but also realize that, like you said, growing and learning is can be very uncomfortable. Um, so thank you for pointing out some, some very important things. And thank you everyone else for joining. I would like to invite you to the next conversation in February. We'll be talking about good partnerships. And actually it's a conversation that um, my current pastor, Pastor Michelle Townsend de Lopez, um, as well as Pastor Muriel Otto from um, Unity in Brookfield um, will be having along with a couple of lay people and talk about um, the partnership that cross in Milwaukee and Unity in Brookfield have. And I think it's something that Catherine, Jean, and George probably can relate to considering how they talked about their partnership with Hepatha. Uh, but I would invite everyone to join us. I think it'll be another enlightening and fun conversation. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your interest, your questions. Um, and we're looking forward to the list of topics, George. And if you have any resources, George, Jean, and Catherine, that you feel would be beneficial for the rest of us, and including the ones that have already been put in the chat, that would be most welcome. Sonia, did you have a comment or a question? Uh, yeah, I'll try to be quick. I'm not known for uh, being quick. So if you need to sign off, just sign off. Um, <clears throat> I was taking notes during uh, uh, your conversation and I noticed you said a few times about um, listening or t how do you talk to, how do you have these uh, uncomfortable conversations with your friends and family, um, you know, people you care about and so on. And I just m made a, a mental note that, and also in that respect, how do you listen to people who need to be heard? Because that's part of the conversation as well, because I, I've been told in my lifetime, I'm 54, oh, get over it, um, blah, 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 blah. So we won't go down that rabbit hole. But also an, another thing is, in my experience in the ELCA, and I've worked um, with uh, my local congregation, um, Greater Milwaukee Synod and Church White, and it has not been my experience that any group from any church other than a church that already has diversity in it to, to have these type of conversations. And these are the conversations that are needed for like-minded and like-viewed people, people that look like you, to challenge you and not back down. That's what we need. That's what an ally is because... I always come off angry or frustrated or whatever when I'm trying to be heard. You don't have to agree with everything I say, but just listening to my experience and understanding that it's not your experience and being okay with that without feeling like you're being accused of being a racist, that I don't even know. Wow. But, um, that made me question you said that your group was diverse in age i wondered how many what was the, the um diversity in men and women or the lgbtq plus or ethnicity in your group because if you have and i'm just saying real quick if you have white people feeling like they're being accused of being racist by other white people like where do we go because <laughs> That's where you have to have those conversations and that's where it needs to start because it's always, I'm always one, the one or a few black people in the room. I'll just say it. My congregation, I'm one. That That's just how it is. So having these conversations, I don't know if you saw when you first said about having com uh, uncomfortable conversation with a black man. I suggested that with my congregation years ago and they just looked at me. 
And I was like, oh, okay. So that's neither here nor there, but I'm like, oh my goodness, you're actually having these conversations. You're actually, and I'm not talking about calling someone out. I'm talking about being in that uncomfortable space, being vulnerable and learning about someone else's experiences, even if it's not my experience, but your friend or your family. How awesome is that, that you can sit in that vulnerability and be okay with it. That's where we are as human beings, that we are so ready to, to defend whatever it is. We're not comfortable being vulnerable. And for Black people, that's what we are every day when we walk out the house. We can't take this off. And that's what people need to understand. I'm not telling you that you have to be, oh, it's okay, blah, blah, blah. We can't take this off. I can't say, oh, I'm not going to be a black person today. I can't say, oh, I'm not going to be a woman today. Well, I guess I could. I don't know. But <laughs> that's neither here nor there. Um, but because uh, I don't want to, I'm I don't want to, I'm not talking about anything else other than us learning about each other, period, as Christians, as children of God as other people that breathe the air that God put into our lungs. Why can't we be okay with being vulnerable in that? Because I, I guarantee Jesus Christ or Jesus, because we made him Christ, but I guarantee Jesus was not comfortable regardless of who he knew he was. He wasn't comfortable being crucified for us. That was very painful, you know, and people don't look at it like that. But we're told every day to forget about the slavery history. We're told every day to forget about every atrocity that has been committed against a person of color in this country since this country was founded. But we're okay with talking, and I do not take this the wrong way, we're okay with talking about what's happening overseas. The atrocities that's going on today overseas we're okay with talking about that, but we can't be okay with talking about the person standing next to me feeling the hurt and pain of something that I might not be a part of intentionally, but by not speaking up about it, I'm allowing it. That's why we need these uncomfortable conversations so that I can grow from it and you can grow from it and we can be better Christians and better people and just be better and have heaven here on earth. If we love each other and love God, like we were told to, we wouldn't be where we are right now. I think maybe that's where someone where we can have these uncomfortable conversations and people can feel okay. But do you have to feel better each time you have a conversation, why can't you walk away being uncomfortable? That's what makes you think and makes you grow because you're gaining a better understanding of other people's plight in this world that might not be yours. And I'm not just talking about black people. I'm talking about white people, other people, any person of any kind of ethnic, anything on the planet. Okay, Sonia, I'm going to stop off now. right there. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I'm going to cut you off now because I know you. <laughs> I know you. So, I, but um, I, appreciate, and I appreciate, I appreciate, I appreciate everything that you're doing. And I'm looking forward to sharing with you and being a part of this journey with all of you. Thank you. So I'm going to say thank you, Sonia. I would <laughs> hope that she is, as they say, preaching to the choir. Um, and that some of the sentiment and the concerns that she shared would be things that you could share with the people that you feel need to hear them. Um, and she um, always speaks with a lot of passion. Uh, and I'm going to say thank you again. Good night. I'm not going to add anything further. I appreciate everyone's time um, and hope to see you next month.